When I was turning 40, I read a book by Harold Bloom called uh, something like the, it's where, where We Shall Find Wisdom, something like that. I should know the title by heart, but I don't remember it. But, but Harold Bloom, the literary critic, was really based at Yale. Um, he, who's quite old now, 80s or so, and read everything a thousand times, an incredible uh, uh, literary critic, late in his life, he's been going back to look at what he's read and its influence on him, really kind of personally. And so he wrote this book on, specifically, what books in his life did he read that gave him wisdom? And it's kind of related to this idea I was saying a second ago, you know, what, what has helped him understand the human condition, you know, in essence. I mean, he has a different way of putting it, but it's the same idea. And uh, the way he sets up his book is he starts by talking about, um, it's chronological, he starts with, with Homer and uh, Plato, you know, one of, the, one of the, the Socratic dialogues versus the Iliad. And he asks himself, okay, uh, and he's a big fan of Plato, he's a big fan of Homer, which of these actually did I have has made me wiser? And after reflection that he shares with you, it's the Homer, it's not the Plato. And he's a big fan of Plato. And he works his way chronologically and he gets to the point where it's Freud or Proust. You know, which one is it? And he's a huge Freudian. And he's like, you know what, it's Proust, it's not Freud. You know, now Plato and Freud are in the business of articulating ideas, of literally trying to advance your wisdom. That's their, that's their intent in a very focused f sense. But part of Bloom's point is that it's actually living through these, these narratives that he's actually gained insight over time. Living with the characters even long after the book is gone. Remembering 20 years later what Hamlet did or said or thought about. And, you know. um, so I was reading this. As I say, I was approaching my 40th birthday. And I was thinking to myself, all right, and this is what was referenced here. I was thinking, let's say I'm able to read one book a month very closely. You know, where I read it with care, I, I wrote, write down my own thoughts about it, I, I discuss it with close friends. Um, if I live till I'm 80, that means I've got 480 books left. That's it, right? So with that in mind, what do I want to read? And so I was sharing this with a close friend of mine uh, and uh, around New Year's Eve or so, and, and she, she's like, I'm in. I, you know, you know, what, what are you going to read? I want to do it. What, you know, I'm, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know. You know, so, so we started talking about it. So we, we, we started with uh, Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. You know, seven volumes, 500 pages per volume, you know. Uh, and it was great. We spent a year and a half doing it. There were four of us, two men, two women. We're all married, but it's no spouses in the group. So, you know, it's, there's no, it's no couples. And we meet every month for dinner, and, and we've been working our way through through books. Now, the, and we're doing this for, I guess, seven years now. Um, now, and, and the litmus test for us is we want to read books together that would merit being reread in our lifetimes. So, we're, so you know, it's got to be substantial enough, rich enough that we could all meet when we're 60 and want to read it again and walk away with new insights. So it has definitely pushed us back towards you know, the classics, or, or, or books which history has already kind of sifted for us. Because history uh, does not tend to do a very good job of including all quality, but it tends to do a very good job of excluding what was thought to be quality but was not. So very good things are lost to time, but very few bad things persist. So a lot of what we read is from 1880 to 1950. A lot of the authors that we read are dead. Most of them are. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, of things that, that I, I read. You know, I often think of, um, you know, if you were going to read a book, uh, you know, I, I think the first book of Remembrance of Things Past is amazing. Swan's Way is terrific. But I, I think if you're going to read a book, like, for instance, I think A Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez is, and that, which probably, how, how many people have read that book? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a substantial portion, but, but you know, again, it, it can be reread. I, I, I went back and we went back and reread it together as a group, and it was terrific to read a second time. Um, but you know, the first sentence of that book, which I'm going to quote roughly, uh, is is you know, it was, it was many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia remembered that distant day when his father took him to discover ice. You know, that's the first sentence. But you unpack that for a second. It's many years later, as he faced the firing squad, you know, he was looking back at that distant day when his father 
took him to see ice. You know, uh, you know what incredible, in a first sentence, what he's just engineered for you, which is, you know, telling you this, is where, this story is going to take you from when this guy was a boy in some place where ice didn't exist prior, and we're going to end up in front of a firing squad before this is all done. You know, and, and what, what a great, and it's going to clearly be about family, it's going to be about generations, it's going to be in an exotic environment, it's got a touch of magic, magic right there in that first sentence because of the discovering of ice. Um, so, you know, uh, but, but I say, you can go through that book and, and, and page for page, it's, it's going to satisfy you. It was such a wonderful read. It was delicious. It was delicious. It was like being tumbled at a cool surf after a hot day. And I'm wondering why it's your first. <laughs> uh. Um, I've, I've, I've written since I was a kid, uh, and I wrote in college, I wrote in graduate school. Um, I moved to New York at the age of 25, and, and at that point, uh, I, I, I was writing full-time, but I decided, you know what, I need to go get a job. And um, so I joined a friend of mine in the investment business, somebody I'd met by chance in, in New York, and uh, I was the first person to join him, and, and we've worked together for 20-plus years now. Um, now, in the first decade, that we were building our, our business, I just stopped writing. Um, and you know, we, we were uh, investing a lot of our time and effort in trying to ensure that we succeeded and trying to improve our craft, serve our clients, teach our younger colleagues, et cetera. Um, and of course, during that time, 25 to 35, I was also dating and hanging around. And so you know, I mean, it, was, it wasn't just work, but, um, but I wasn't writing. And in, in the back of my mind, I kind of knew if I did not try to write a work of fiction that I felt good about, but by the time I was 55, I would probably be bitter and a drinker. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, so I mean, so I, I, eventually I got around to it, and now I'm just a drinker. <laughs> no, but so, <laughs> but you know, so, so I, I, I did, I, I, I picked up fiction again at the age of around 35. I, I wrote, uh, I had written maybe 50 short stories as a younger man. I wrote a full-length novel that I didn't like. It took me about seven years. I put that in a drawer. Um, and then I tried to learn from that experience and I launched this effort, which I wrote in 2006 and then revised in the years after. So that, that's why it, it, it took me so long to get around to this. I, I, it won't take me so long to get to the second. <laughs> I think as, as some people here know, I, I, uh, that what I'm working on right now, I'm, I'm late, but what I'm working on is uh, a short story which follows Eve to Hollywood. When I closed the manuscript, I, 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 re I really didn't have an interest in following Katie or Tinker. I really felt very good about everything that you know, even though you know a lot about Katie and little about Tinker, I, I felt very good about what you know. But the thing that was kind of bugging me at night was I was like, what is Eve doing in Hollywood? You know, I was, God, you know. So, so I'm, I'm writing a very long short story that, that starts basically on the day that she's on the train and, and, um, and anybody who sends me their email address through, through my website at amortwells.com, I will send you that story when it's done. Um, well, thanks, but uh, <laughs> when it's done. But as, as, soon, as, as, as soon as I'm finished with that, I'll, I've, I've got my next book already laid out and I'm looking forward to writing it. Yes, in the middle. Yep. Uh, is a period photograph. It's from Condé Nast, uh, which is kind of a coincidence, I guess. Um, and, and we don't know, Condé Nast doesn't know, was this a set piece that was like to illustrate an article? Uh, was it something that was potentially for cooperative advertising? Was it a person in society? We know, it probably was a set piece for, for an illustration for something they were doing. Um, but it is, it is very much from the late 30s. Uh, it, it was the first thing that, that Viking, uh, published by Viking Penguin, it was the first picture that they suggested for the cover. Um, it was sort of a meeting of about eight of us, and, uh, and I, I thought it was great. You know, I think I, I really was pleased with it. Um, and uh, it's sort of a silly anecdote, but, but as we were going around the table getting uh, feedback, my, my agent from William Morris was kind of the one person who was you know, sort of saying, you know, I don't, I don't love it. And so you know, we took a break in the meeting and, and I, I, you know, I said, uh, Dorian, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised you don't like the photograph because I thought it was very strong. And, 
you know, I, I, think, it's, I think it's very sexy and, and, and glamorous. And she said, yeah, you know, it's sexy and glamorous, but, and I said, Dorian, there's no sentence in the English language that is, it's sexy and glamorous, but, and you can finish it. You know, so. so anyway, so we went with this, but. Uh, I was say there was somebody way up there. Yes, please. It drives me crazy. <laughs> no, um, uh, no. The, uh, the I, I have received offers to option the book, um, and I have not accepted any of them yet. Um, it was kind of in last fall, and I, I was just like, you know what? I'm I'm really focused on the book right now, and uh, ensuring that. I have a chance to speak with people who, who are interested in the book. Uh, you know, the paperback comes out this uh, June. So I said, I don't want to talk to any more people about it until next summer. I said, great, because the are always better. All right, thanks. <laughs> I know, I, I, I wasn't in a rush. So, so, but I, but, but at, at the end of the day, the goal really is to find the right fit, and that's a tricky thing. And so I, part of the purpose for me of waiting was I wanted to see who surfaced um, and so that we'd have a chance to ideally find a person who's a very good fit for the book. I don't mean that as an actor and actress. I mean as a, a director or screenwriter, but, but uh, we'll have to see. Uh, yeah, sorry, yes. yes. <coughs> Was there a deeper meaning or relationship <clears throat> between the uh, 100 Rules of Civility, I believe it was Washington's Rules of Civility, and the plot line of the story? Um, the question is, was there a deeper meaning associated with, with, um, with the, the, the integration of rules of civility into the tale? I, I, the answer is, is I hope so. Um, and I, I think in any book uh, of, of, with narrative economy, uh, you should expect that, right? So, so meaning that I shouldn't be tacking it on there just for the fun of it. I don't get paid by the page. But, but, but setting aside that, I, I mean that, that a, a disciplined writer should be asking themselves at every page, does this belong here? And, 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 and belonging need, means that it has to have an integrated place in the story without question. So, um, but I, part of the editing process is going back and weighing that yourself. And some of that's instinct. Some of it is, is I could articulate for you. Uh, there are elements of it which I could not articulate for you, and, and those are the way are the most important elements. But, but so, so uh, you know, to, to answer your question, um, I, the rules of civility were not a part of the book in the first, in the earliest drafting of the book. I had outlined the book in total. Um, I, I, I had designed, all, developed, all the, invented the characters in advance, um, partly because my, my goal was to write the book in one year. Uh, in, 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 revi in reviewing the failed book that I had written over seven years, one of the most striking things about that uh, book was that my favorite parts were the parts I wrote in the first year and never changed, and the parts that I'd been editing for seven years still drove me crazy. So I was like, you know, well, what if you wrote the book in a year? <laughs> Let's see what happens. So I designed this book in advance very carefully to be able to do that. So I had the outline very carefully done. I had the characters invented. The book has 26 chapters because there are 52 weeks in the year. And I wanted to write a chapter for a week, edit it for a week, and move on. And so, which is what I did, and I started the book on January 1st, 2006, which is why the book opens on New Year's Eve, and I finished it on New Year's Eve a year later, which is kind of what the book does. But, um, <laughs> I was moving along through it, and I, I, I was, you know, I can't remember five, six chapters in, and, uh, and I, at the time, in, in that draft, the first draft, Tinker was uh, very interested in the Founding Fathers. That was part of my, my thought process of him. He, he was very interested in Franklin and Madison and Jefferson and uh, the whole crew. Uh, he had knew their, their histories. Uh, he could quote some of their writings. You know, he admired them. Um, and in the first draft, in the, in the first couple chapters, there were, he, he and Katie had discussed them, and you know, he had offered his insights about them, et cetera. Um, and, I, I, and I got to a point where I wanted to include something from the Founding Fathers, a document of some kind. The, in, in this case, Katie finds the book in his office as she's kind of touring the apartment late at night when Eve's had her accident. Um, and so I turned to my own collection of the Founding Fathers, I, I'm a fan of the group, and, uh, and I have a lot of their primary writings in my library, and so I, I pulled the, the collected writings of Washington off my shelf, and when you open it up, the first thing in the collected writings of Washington in almost any volume is going to be this strange list that he compiled as a teenager 
because it's kind of the earliest thing that we have in the father of our country's handwriting, right? So it's always chronologically at the front. And the minute I saw it, you know, this list of 110 rules of behavior um, that he had transcribed, he didn't invent them, but he had transcribed them, taking, you know, because he wanted to aspire to them, I thought, oh, this is it. Uh, this is the only thing that Tinker knows. He doesn't know anything about Jefferson and about the Constitutional Congress and about Adams and he can't quote all those guys. And it was kind of a window on what was irking me about the draft so far. Because if there was a character in the book who would love the Founding Fathers and know their bios and be able to quote them and talk about them articulately, it's Katie, not him. He's a Tom Sawyer figure. You know, so, but the idea that, some, that his mother would have given him this document and that it could have meant something to him, you know, that made sense to me. So you gotta go back to the beginning and rewrite along those lines. You know, it helped me sharpen my understanding of him. Now, but thematically, why did I think, oh, this is perfect? Well, the interesting thing about that list, you know, 110 items, is that, or an interesting thing, is that it has many rules of manners in them. You know, don't talk with your mouth open. You know, when you're walking with an older person, you be walking next to the curb. Never interrupt, you know, somebody who's senior to you. These are rules of politeness, in essence. But the rules of politeness are embedded with rules of integrity, moral maxims, about not lying, about, about helping those in need, about being uh, respecting and being honorable towards others. You know. And I think what's one of the things that's interesting in retrospect about that is that in our society, we kind of now have divided those things into two. We have moral maxims, we have maxims of politeness, but you want to keep in mind that for hundreds of years, there was no distinction you wouldn't have been able to even define what the difference between one was and the other. Because all this finds its roots in chivalry, right? You know, a, a knight, literally, uh, was expected to follow these same kinds of maxims. And that meant being, uh, having courtly behavior, knowing how to uh, uh, act inside the, you know, the hall of the king, as it were, how to act towards the ladies, how to act at table. Um, and you had to save a damsel in distress and be true to the king and be willing to lose your life and those things too. And for the knight, that's what being a knight meant. You did both those things. It, was, that, it, it wasn't you know, either or. Um, and, and that concept actually got handed down through the centuries. So you see it in the Renaissance, in descriptions of what it means to be a man of virtue. You see it in the Enlightenment. And that's really what got inherited by Washington. And you actually see Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, all talk about these things because they're picking up this inheritance from the Enlightenment, which is really talking about what does it mean to be a true gentleman? And a gentleman is someone who's both polite but also honorable. And again, no distinction, right? So you can't have one without the other. Um, and, and so now within the form of the book, this is a novel of manners, and all the characters to some degree are, are donning forms of behavior to influence the way that others around them are perceiving them, uh, to pay the certain path or to, uh, to gain something from the other person. Sometimes it could be talking themselves down, other times talking up. You know, it's not always, it's not only one direction. And, um, and so all the characters are doing that to some degree. So again, the idea that, and that the founding father of this country could be writing this list about how you should behave in polite society and be a good person at the same time, I just thought was such a great, sort of nexus of those ideas in, in our contemporary society too. You know, where does how we behave and how we perceive begin and end relative to how, in, how much integrity we have? Um, and I think, you know, it's valuably mindful of those things. Uh, do have, yes, please. I was kind of curious about the process of the research that you had to go through to be able to place yourself in a position to write a book that's in the era of the late 30s and also how you researched and kind of put yourself into the role to write a character from a woman's point of view? Um, so it's a two-part question. It's a two-part answer. Uh, the, the first question really is about the, the, the period and, and researching. How did I research the 1930s? The, the answer is that I didn't. Now, and that's kind of a sleight of hand a little bit for me, but uh, the, I, I, I didn't do any applied research. Now, I'm 47, and I have the advantage in writing this book of being able to draw on a lot of uh, uh, of cultural knowledge because I've been a student of culture for 30 years. 
very different if you're writing out your first book when you're 25 and you've just read On the Road and you're like, I want to write a book like On the Road, you know, <laughs> you know, you know okay, I get that, you know, but, but I wanted to at that time too. But, but you know, at, at this age, you know, you're drawing on a, on a very wide uh, experience with culture, you know, uh, and for me, I certainly have always been interested in the period between 1900 and 1940. I've read the books, I, I've, I've watched the movies, I've listened to the music, I've studied the paintings. Excuse me, so, so I, have a, I have a pretty rich sense of that period. So in writing the book, I decided I would do no applied research, but here's why. I, I, I really felt that um, if I did research when I was about to write the book, you, I ran the risk that facts that came out of that research would go clunk in the narrative. Now, and I, every author has their own practices, but, but my take on this one is, if you told a French author go out and write a book about a young girl in the suburbs in America in the 19, early 1960s, and they did their research, you run the risk that there's that sentence that says, you know, as the girl is coming in the kitchen right before dinner time, she sees mom, you know, open the Frigidaire and take out the bird's eye frozen peas as, you know, Paul McCartney sings Love, Love Me Do on the radio. Okay, I, you know, okay, I get it, right, 1963 or four, whatever it is, you know, so... And, and now in reality, if you were that girl looking back on that memory or you knew that girl, uh, you know, what, what would strike you as you came in and saw your mother doing that, first of all, is that in incredible thing of that, if you take bird's eyes frozen peas, you, you, you take them out of the little thin cardboard sleeve and they come out as a brick, right? And, and every person my age in America has seen their mother break that brick over the boiling water. And everybody my age has, you know, at that age, ate a frozen pea at some point. You know, a lot of people for, you know, who will never eat a frozen pea again, but you know, we all knew it because they'd spill on the counter and you'd put one in your mouth. You say, oh my God, that's a frozen pea. So, <laughs> but you know, and they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't bad. But meanwhile, now meanwhile, importantly, on that day, Mom could have slept with, you know, the guy who mows the lawn, well, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and, and, she, and she she could be feeling a great sense of renewed youth and, and someone who cares about her or whatever. Or she could have just found out that dad had cheated on her. And, and she could be feeling, you know, crushed. And either way, the girl who's walking through the door doesn't know that. But every word that you would write for that scene would have to be different depending on which of those two things happened to her that day, the mother. So you're the young girl walking through, you're watching the peas be broken, you're seeing everything that's happening in the background without that child knowing it, this thing has happened that we're gonna learn about later, right? Either it was the affair one way or the other, and every little aspect of that has to indicate that state of mind, right? So of the mother's and maybe the girl picking up on it, you know, but not even necessarily being self-conscious of it. So, but that's what the writing process is about for me, right? And so you wanna be careful about the research dynamic because what you wanna make sure is that you know enough to walk through that kitchen door and see it as if it's happening to you, as if you're looking back on that memory for the first time. Um, now, you know, why about writing from the perspective of a woman? I, I um, you know, I'll start by saying that that you know what, what is what is the goal of, of writing narrative fiction, you know? And, and the, well, I, actually, uh, let me let me start with something else. I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, an amazing thing happened in America in the 1970s. Here comes another sweeping, unsupported generality. <laughs> the amazing thing happened. The word amazing is almost always a clue that I'm about to do that. But so, but. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, America had this incredible flourishing uh, of narrative voices that broadened the canon. Um, it's coming out of the 1960s when you had the emergence of important uh, male black writers uh, for the first time. You suddenly had the African-American female writers like, like uh, uh, Toni Morrison and, and her peers, Alice Walker. Um, and then you had you know, uh, Asian-American female writers. Uh, but you had then people writing about the inner city experience. Uh, uh, gay novels, uh, Louise Erdrich writing about the life on the reservation, you know, in the 70s and 80s uh, in Love Medicine. 
Um, and this is an, an incredible thing for American narrative fiction that these various voices that had not been a part of the publishing arena, the reading arena for a century, suddenly had a voice, uh, an avenue to publish, uh, an audience who was interested in learning about that experience, the different tone, the different language that came with that. That was a great thing. A side effect, though, of that development was, I think, that uh, we as Americans began to assume that everybody writes their book from the slice of life that they emerged, from which they emerged. And, and it's so strong is this expectation today that actually almost all the literary scandals of the last 20 years have involved someone turning out not to be the thing in the book. You know, famously James Fry or whatever, but, but you know, it's, 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 it's many examples of, you know, the, you know, the best-selling, I, I can't remember the examples, but it's along the lines of, you know, it turns out that, that the person who wrote that book was not a, a prostitute drug addict in LA, it was a guy in Philadelphia. What? You know, and people are like, well, I can't believe that. Why didn't, you know, but, but this is part of what's happened is, is the publishing industry has basically said, well, you know, it's actually going to do better if it's really, you know, we pretend it was from you or, you know, or whether they're saying that out loud or not, but the readership eats it up. And then it's a crisis when it turns out that it's an invention. But, but for hundreds of years, this is not what would have happened. Right, so for hundreds of years, and this is where we get to the purpose of narrative fiction I was about to say, is if you look back at you know, what is the purpose of, of, of writing narrative fiction, um, I think at the end of the day, you're trying to depict the human condition. Right? And, and the human condition is, uh, is ultimately a sum of paradoxes. Right? As and I, I know this was in the, uh, you know, I, I commented on this when I was interviewed for the, the, the leaflet that was handed out, so some of you may have, have read me on this, but. But the, the human condition is a, is a, is a, a sum of, of paradoxes. We can actually perceive the infinite as a species. It's really an incredible concept when you think of it. Right? You know, we even we have mathematics built around it, but we can kind of we can imagine time going on. We can imagine space that's far outside of where what we can witness. But our life is finite. You know, this is an incredible. We feel that sense of infinity, and yet our life is going to come to an end. Similarly. As a species, we are very ambitious. We like to build things. We like to build reputations, buildings. We like to remember the course of events. Um, so we're very sort of history mindful, as it were, to sort of build things forever uh, as a mindset. Um, and yet, uh, we know how to take incredible satisfaction, spiritual satisfaction, from the most ephemeral items. You know, the smell of a flower, the chirp of a bird, you know, a year in our children's lives. Um, you know, these are paradoxes. We, we raise our children uh, and ultimately, to some degree, to become strangers. You know, love, uh, when we fall in love, it feels like it could go on forever and that it could withstand many, many onslaughts and yet, in a very short period of time, it can become incredibly fragile, you know, in a, in a relationship and fall apart. Um, so, this is the human condition. Right, is that, that this is the reality of our lives, and we are trying to grapple with these things uh, in the course of our lives. And the greatest ambition of fiction or narrative is to try to provide someone a mechanism with which to explore the human condition in such a way that they may walk away with insights about the human condition about their own experiences, about other people's experiences. It may change their insights. It may broaden them. Now, the best of books are made with enough ambiguity and enough intricacy of, of elements with careful economy such that five different people could read that book, enjoy it, and walk away with very different impressions. And the same person could read that book at three different points in their lives, enjoy it, and walk away with different impressions. That's the greatest ambition of the narrative writer, period. You know, I don't, you know so, and, and, well, thank you, but. Um, now, the, the, the reason I, I say this, and by the way, this is why Shakespeare survives. And this is why he is appropriately famous, is because that is what his plays have done, is with great economy and art, he's created these little environments with, rich with ambiguity where it turns out century after century after century, we can revisit them and walk away with new and heartfelt insight. Um, so now, you know, 
pausing on Shakespeare there, nobody said to him, oh, are you going to write characters from a male and a female perspective? You know, are you, what do you mean? What do you mean? You, you, know, you, mean, you mean Othello's black or Shylock's Jewish? You know, I don't mean that to belittle the question. I mean it that, that I think that, that the mindset, as you say, for centuries was this is the ambition. Depict the human condition. And the assumption would be that a serious narrative writer must have strong command of human psychology in as many of its forms as possible and will use free reign to depict whatever individuals are going to help the story come to life. And so to tell you the truth, it never, I never crossed my mind to write this book from anybody's perspective other than a woman. Because from the very first day when I thought up this idea of the story, it was a guy in the picture and a woman looking at him. And that was it. Yes. As Katie observes in the story, you know, Tinker is, uh, you know, she's sort of like, oh, how cute. You know, these, these wasps, they always, you know, name their kids after tradesmen. You know, Smith, Cooper, Tinker, you know, like, um, and, you know, and she sort of thinks it's ironic. But, uh, but no, beyond that, I didn't. That's a short question, so I'll give you one more. I'm omnivorous, or whatever the drinking version of that would be. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I, I do think the martini is a pretty terrific invention. It's an American invention. It's, it stood the test of time. It's, it's that combination of elegance, purity, and impact. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.